today we'll be in Hebrews chapter 11. And I've titled today's message, A Remarkable Kind of Faith. And we'll be in, again, Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be covering verses 17 through 29. So while you're turning in your Bibles there, um, I just really, I want to mention just a few things here. When we began chapter 11 last week, I mentioned to you that this chapter will be addressing one of the three great virtues, the walk of faith. And in the first 16 verses that we looked at last week um, in this letter, it gave us a simple yet profound two-part description of biblical faith. The first part told us what it is. A faith is the certainty in the future promises of God, even though those promises haven't yet been fulfilled. And the second part told us what it does. Faith provides an unshakable evidence that the unseen spiritual blessings of Christianity are absolutely certain and real. Now, when these two are applied, it then produces a dynamic activism that moves a believer to positively respond to what God has revealed in his word. So basically, it's an act of faith that consists in simply taking God at his word and living life according to what he said. And the writer then began giving us several Old Testament examples of people who did that. Men and women who never gave up believing, trusting, and obeying in the promises of God. And although these early forefathers didn't receive the things that were, that were promised, they continued to hold on to their faith because they still saw those promises at a distance. And as a result, God honored their faith and is not ashamed to be called their God. The lesson there is that we must continue to believe that God will make good on his word and shower us with grace if we come to him with empty hands of faith. And so now as we continue on in this chapter, the author, the author will also continue to share with us more examples of what, life, of what a life of, life of faith looks like. And so before I begin reading, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, yes, as Isaac prayed, we're thankful that you've brought us here. We're thankful that we, you know, we're just able to worship you, Lord. We know that you really, you honor and you enjoy when we worship you out of a pure heart, Lord. And so now as we open up your word, I pray that you will speak powerfully to each person that's here. That you also speak powerfully to those that are watching and listening to this message. That you will show them things that they never knew about. That you will open up their minds and hearts, Lord. And that you will also change lives, marriages, relationships. Lord, we want to honor you with this time now. And so pray that you will help us and remove all distractions. So pour your spirit, Lord, powerfully upon this room now. Pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll be beginning in verse 17. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received the promises and yet... He was offering his one and only son, the one to whom it had been said, your offspring will be called through Isaac. He considered God to be able to even raise someone from the dead. Therefore, he received him back, figuratively speaking. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of his sons each of the sons of Joseph, and he worshipped, leaning on top of his staff. 
By faith, Joseph, as he was nearing the end of his life, mentioned the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions concerning his bones. Now, in the first three verses of this, of this section that we just read, it continues the author's exposition of Abraham, offering a third major event that exemplified his faith. The first one we covered last week, the first and second ones we covered last week, which were his move from Ur into a land that he had no idea where it was or where he was going. And the second one was becoming a father at the, age, at the old age he was at, him and Sarah becoming parents at the, at the old age. Now, most of you probably know the story, but in case you don't, back in Genesis chapter 21, God told Abraham that the covenant promises would continue through his son Isaac. And as the story progresses, Genesis chapter 22 tells us that Abraham faced an excruciating test. There... <clears throat> There in Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2, it says that God tested Abraham and said to him, said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Now, to me, Genesis 22 really is one of the most important and also one of the most infamous passages in all of Scripture. Why is that? Because God tells Abraham to take Isaac, the son that he loves, and the son who will continue the line of promise up to the land of Moriah and to sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. Now, we know from what we've already covered in this letter so far that a burnt offering is when an animal is killed, its blood is drained, and its carcass is burned. As you can imagine, any father told to do this to his son would be tested beyond anything he could possibly imagine. But this was Abraham's test. Remarkably, though, as hard as it was, the text tells us that Abraham obeyed the Lord. In Genesis 22, verses 3 and 4, it says, So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He, spit, he split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. So even though the Lord's instructions seem to contradict his promise to Abraham, the man did as God commanded. Yet in the end, we see that God's command didn't really contradict his promise. See, Abraham had no doubt that God was able to raise Isaac even if he had to go through the sacrifice. And so this is what the author is explaining in verse 19 of our text. Now, Abraham's own words in Genesis 22 verse 5 show that he believed Isaac would return alive. There it says that he told his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. He didn't say I will come back to you or he will come back to you. He said we'll, we will come back to you. Therefore, because Abraham responded in faith to God's command, God reiterated his promise to Abraham a little further down in Genesis chapter 22. 
In verse 17, he said, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the city gates of their enemies. Now, in a sense, Isaac, he did, he died. This is what the second half of verse 19 points out. He didn't die physically, but he did die in a figurative sense when he was taken right up to the point of death and then brought back to life. Now, if you really think about it, this story and Isaac's role in particular actually reveals something remarkable that was yet to come. It anticipated the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our great high priest. That story in Genesis ultimately reveals that Abraham passed God's test because he was committed to God's promises. He showed faith through his willingness to obey God's command and sacrifice his son. He trusted God to deliver Isaac. And he may have even perceived that in doing so, he would be, it would be the greatest display of God's glory. My friends, that's the story of the gospel. God has determined to save sinners and has done so in a way that brings him the greatest glory possible. This explains why God, who loves his son to an even greater degree than Abraham loved Isaac, sent his son to die for us. God's word is true and his promises will always come to pass. Even when we can't envision how he will do what he's promised. Nevertheless, we're called to obey him and to follow him. Listen carefully, by faith. By faith. Now some of us may be thinking, but this is so far beyond me. This is way above my head. How could I ever rise to such great heights of faith? Abraham was a one-of-a-kind one of kind of guy. Men like him only come along every one or two millennia. Here's the thing. We need to understand that Abraham's great faith, it didn't begin when he offered up his son. As I mentioned in the beginning, it began the moment he left Ur to an unknown place. And when he believed God's promise that he and Sarah would have a child in their old age. But we also mustn't forget the low points in his life when he did lack faith, when he lapsed in faith. For example, the times when he lied to save his own butt by saying that Sarah was his sister. Or when, impatient for an heir, he and Sarah took matters into their own hands and Sarah allowed Abraham to impregnate Hagar and become the mother of Ishmael there in Genesis chapter 16. We must understand that it was through ups and downs that Abraham grew in faith until he became capable of the ultimate display. A Spanish philosopher wrote these perceptive words. Those who believe that they believe, those who believe that they believe in God, but without passion in their hearts, without anguish in mind, without certainty, without doubt, without an element of despair, even in their consolation, believe only in God, the idea, the God idea, not God himself. 
those words again. Think about those words. So we must understand then that faith that never doubts is a dead faith because it's never exercised. As believers, you and I were sinners who have trusted in God. But like Abraham, in spite of our weaknesses and failures, we're called to have a kind of certainty, a kind of a certain kind of faith that profoundly believes and obeys God's word. But the road to strong faith, that road there, it's never a smooth road. Faith, my friends, will be tested. Inevitably, there will be times of uncertainty and doubt, and yes, even despair. But the soul that clings to God will experience growth and notable triumphs of faith. So, well, after Abraham died, we then, the writer here, the author, then tells us that he was succeeded by patriarchs who were nevertheless similarly imperfect men, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But what impresses the writer of Hebrews is that when they came uh, to what they considered to be their final hour, they had a faith that looked beyond death. Like verse 1 basically says, they were sure of what they hoped for and certain of what they didn't see. Meaning that they were convinced that death would not frustrate God's purposes. That his word would be fulfilled. And because our, my time is limited here, I, I really can't get into all the stories, the intricacies of, of each one of their stories. Um, I, I will say this. In Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, we have four generations of faith. These men sometimes failed, but basically they were men of faith. They weren't perfect, but they were devoted to God and trusted His word. In Genesis chapter 27, Isaac passed the promises and the blessings to Jacob. And in Genesis chapter 48 and 49, Jacob shared them with his 12 sons. Now let me take a moment just to point out how truly remarkable Joseph's faith was. After the way his family treated him, you'd think that he would have abandoned his faith. But instead... It grew stronger. Even the ungodly influence of Egypt didn't weaken his trust in God. Even when he was in prison, falsely imprisoned, and when he was forgotten about there for many years, it didn't weaken his faith. It strengthened it. It strengthened his trust in God. And even though... He could have. Joseph didn't use his family, his job, or his circumstances as an excuse for unbelief. Why is that? Well, two main reasons. Genesis chapter 50 verses 24 through 26 tells us that Joseph knew. He knew what he believed. That God would one day deliver his people from Egypt. And number two, Joseph also knew where he belonged. He belonged in Canaan, not Egypt. 
So he made them promise in Exodus chapter 13, verse 19, to carry his remains out of Egypt at the Exodus. And you know what? They did. They did carry his bones. Brother and sister in Christ, I hope that you find the faith of these men as admirable as I do. We ought to admire that in spite of not having a complete Bible, their faith was strong. And we must also admire how faithful they were to hand God's promises down from one generation to another. In spite of their failures and tests, these men and women believed. They believed God. And God honored them by inspiring the writer of Hebrews to mention them here. These men that we've seen so far became great because they learned that God's word never fails and that it must be obeyed at all costs, at all costs. So my question to you is this. If God's word says it, do you believe it? Do you believe what God's word says about Jesus? For example, speaking of Jesus, it says in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. So again, I ask you, do you believe what God's Word says about Jesus? Do you believe what it says about salvation? In John chapter 4, verse 6, Jesus said, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let me put that same verse in in a different way. Jesus said this, I am the way, I am the truth, And I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. No one at all. Would you believe what it says? What the Bible says about salvation? Do you believe what the Bible says about judgment? In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, we're told we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And what's being implied there, what you did while you're alive, while you were walking around in this body of yours, you will be held accountable for that, for how you lived your life. You will be repaid for what you did in the body. Now, Do you believe that? I can go on and on and continue to ask if you believe in what the Bible says about wealth, about purity, about marriage, and a bunch of other topics. But it's more important for me to ask you this really important question. If you do believe what the Bible says about these things, are you obeying them? Are you obeying the word of God? James chapter 1, verse 22 through 24 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in the mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. So as I mentioned before, these men and women believed God and he bore witness to their faith. God can also honor your faith. 
You can honor, uh, honor your faith as well. And all you have to do is begin taking those small steps of faithful obedience. You know what those are for you personally. Maybe God has told you, you know what, I will bless you tremendously if you just put away that thing that's distracting you from me. Get rid of that person that's keeping you away from me. Get rid of those things that are keeping you from coming to church. And it begins by taking those steps of faith. And yes, for some, it could be even more challenging things. Maybe he's called you or he's told you you need to get away from where you're living at now and, and move to a place where I will tell you. But you trust me. It's going to bless you. You've got to take those steps as difficult and challenging as they are. And again, they will bless you. You will, you will be blessed. Simple steps of faithful obedience, my friends. Now, for the rest of our time together, we'll be reading about one more remarkable person who displayed a remarkable kind of faith. So now let's go back to our text and pick up in verse 23. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God rather than than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. For he considered reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, since he was looking ahead to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger, for Moses persevered as one who sees himself, who sees him who is invisible. By faith, he instituted the Passover, the sprinkling of the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. By faith, they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry, dry land. When the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned. as he continues to explore remarkable faith, the remarkable faith of Israel's patriarchs, the author of Hebrews now focuses on the faith Moses displayed during the events of the Exodus. But first he begins mentioning the faith of Moses' parents. Well, his parents... They saw that he was a child of destiny, one whom God had marked out for a special work. Their faith that God's purposes would be worked out gave them the courage to defy, to defy the king's edict and to hide the child for three months. It's in the following verse, verse 24, that the writer then starts on the faith of Moses and tells us how by faith Moses himself had made several noble renunciations. First of all, he refused Egypt's fame. He was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter and therefore assured of a place on the top of Egypt's social ladder on the top of 
Egypt's social elite, perhaps even Pharaoh's successor. But he had been born of better blood, a member of God's chosen earthly people. From this nobility, he could not step down to Egypt's royalty. In his adult years, he made the choice. He would not hide his, na- his true nationality to win a few short years of earthly fame. And what was the result? Instead of occupying a line or two of hieroglyphics on some obscure tomb, he is memorialized in God's eternal book. Instead of being found in a museum as an Egyptian mummy, he's found as a man of God. Second, verse 25 says that he repudiated the pleasures of Egypt. Humble association with the suffering people of God meant more to him than the transient gratification of his appetites. The privileges of sharing ill treatment with his own people was greater pleasure to him than the dissipation in Pharaoh's court. Third, verse 26 says that he turned his back on the treasures of Egypt, the treasures in Egypt. Faith enabled him to see that the fabulous, that the fabulous treasure Houses of Egypt were worthless. They were nothing in light of eternity. So he chose to suffer the same kind of reproach as the Messiah would later suffer. See, loyalty to God and love for his people were valued by him more than the combined wealth that was in Egypt. He knew that these were the things that would count the most the minute after that, the minute after he died. Then, in verse 26, the writer says that he also renounced Egypt's monarch. Emboldened by faith, he made his exit from the land of bondage, careless of the wrath of the king. It was a clear break from the politics of this world. He feared Pharaoh so little because he feared God so much. He kept his eyes on the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal power. Amen. Those words are found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses, verses 15 and 16. That's what he kept his eyes on. And finally, in verse 28, he rejected Egypt's religion. By instituting the Passover And by sprinkling the blood, he emphatically separated himself from Egyptian idolatry forever. He flung down the gauntlet in defiance of of the religious establishment. For him, salvation was through the blood of the Lamb, not through the waters of the Nile. As a result, the firstborn of Israel were spared while the firstborn of Egypt were slain by the destroyer. The writer then moves on to talk about the spectacular event at the Red Sea. Now, at first, the Red Sea seemed to spell disaster for the Hebrew refugees. So, with the enemy in hot pursuit, they seemed to be trapped. But in obedience to God's word, they moved forward and 
the waters parted. Exodus 14 tells us that when the Egyptians tried to follow, their chariot wheels became clogged. The waters returned to their usual place and Pharaoh's armies were drowned. Thus, the Red Sea became a causeway of deliverance to Israel, but a dead end of doom to the Egyptians. Don't you find it amazing? I know that I do. That one's man, one man's faith can be so authentic and effectual that it can elevate a whole people and secure their deliverance. Well, let me tell you, this truth there holds great promise for us as Christians. What I'm saying is that vibrant, authentic faith can elevate our families, churches, and communities. It isn't too much to say that it can even be a vehicle for corporate deliverance. Brothers and sisters, never, ever underestimate the power of real faith. And so what does this all mean to us? Well, we understand what it meant to the early Jewish church, which saw itself as a kind of exile amidst the, money, the mounting hostility of Roman culture. What was going to get them through their Egypt was faith. Believing God's word about the promise of a future reward and seeing the unseen. This is what's necessary to survive. Friends, our culture is becoming increasingly Philistine, meaning simple biblical faith will become so abhorrent to popular culture that faithful Christians will be persecuted. And we, actually, and we can actually see that now. It's because we believe in, in Christ. We have this faith in Christ. And because we believe in marriage, the sanctity of marriage and the sanctity of life, a marriage was designed by God, ordained by God to be between one man and one woman. The life is beautiful and that it's valuable and that every child deserves a chance to, to live. But here's the thing, that even though we are seeing that now, we are seeing that Christians are being persecuted and being reviled because of our faith, I'm also convinced that some, by God's grace, will draw upon Moses' example and will thereby gain strength to live for God. See, verse 28 shows us that faith brings out. Verse 29 shows us that faith takes us through. And verse 30 shows us that faith brings us in. When we trust God, we get what God can do. But when we trust ourselves, we only get what weak people can do. The experience of Moses is proof that true biblical faith means obeying God in spite of circumstances and in spite of consequences. Now, I think that if you and I had been writing this chapter, the next section that we're, we won't be reading it or covering it today, but when we do get to it, then, you know, if we had written it, the next section uh, 
would be faith wandering. But here's the thing. There's no mention of Israel's failure and 40 years of wasted time. Why? Because that was an an experience. That was an experience of unbelief, not faith. Those 40 years that they spent wandering in the desert was an experience of unbelief, not faith. The writer did use this experience in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 as an illustration of doubting the word. But nowhere in Hebrews chapter 11 in this chapter that we're covering here, will you find a record of any failure because of unbelief? You see, my friends, you see, Christian brother and sister, faith records only the victories. And God will show you your victories. One day when you're face to face with him and you're standing before him, I believe that, yeah, he will show you your victories. He will reveal to you those times that you trusted in his word. You had that remarkable faith. And he blessed you tremendously. And you worked in you and through you in amazing ways. And you're going to be like, wow, I, only w- I was able to go through it because of you. Not because of me, but because of you. And God will honor you. God will reward you. And we've given those promises in Scripture. And where Jesus is there preparing a place for us He's up in heaven preparing a place for us. There are treasures up in heaven also awaiting us beyond our comprehension, beyond our understanding, beyond anything that this world will ever offer. And all you have to do is have faith. Have a remarkable kind of faith. And you start walking in obedience. I imagine him saying, that's my boy. That's my daughter. And I love them so much. I'm so proud of them. So you're tired of living this life, not knowing where you're going. Well, I want to invite you to the cross. I want to invite you to come to Jesus and ask him to forgive you. You'll find that he will. And he'll give you new life. He will give you new purpose. And that hole that you had deep in your heart will be filled. So if you want to be born again, if you want Jesus to to be your Lord and Savior, wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And with all your heart, with all sincerity, as if he was there right in front of you, I want you to pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit it. And I ask you to please forgive me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead three days later. I now Repent, I turn from my sins and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. 
And now thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that welcome to the family of God. If you need help in your next steps, reach out to us and we will guide you. We'll maybe help you find a church wherever you're at. And if you're here locally, we want to invite you to Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel here in the corner of Hondo Pass and Gateway South. So come and join us if that's what you would like. So thank you for joining us this week. Thank you for watching and listening to this message. Uh, again, as I said in the beginning, if you believe this message has blessed you, let us know. Um, also, share it with others who you think may be blessed by this message as well. Um, I hope that you have a great week. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you as we f next week as we finish uh, this chapter, chapter 11. Be blessed. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.